Now, we're, we're really fortunate. Our next speaker is Dr. Sawyer Hugit penner um, who I'm happy to call uh, my friend and colleague for a long time. Dr. Hugit penner is an endocrinologist in New Westminster, working um, in outpatient clinic and at the Royal Columbian Hospital Diabetes and Pregnancy Clinic and on the inpatient wards. She completed her internal medicine residency and endocrine metabolism fellowship at UBC and then did additional training at U of T on endocrinology and pregnancy and female reproductive endocrinology. She has an interest and focus in endocrine diagnoses during pregnancy planning and throughout pregnancy as well as in the treatment of PCOS and primary ovarian insufficiency. Um, all right, so Dr. Huget Penner is gonna talk to us about thyroid management during preconception and pregnancy and um, I'll just get you to go ahead and share your screen, Sawyer. All right. Oh, hang on one sec. Let me get the slideshow going. Can you? Can everyone see that? Hopefully, that's working. It looks perfect. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Dunn and PCRM, for having me uh, today to speak. Um, I can quickly touch base on what you were saying, Dr. Dunn, about the insulin levels. I agree 100% with you. I don't order them um, in my PCOS patients. Generally, it doesn't change management. It's not recommended in the guidelines. Um, typically, you can see signs of insulin resistance on exams, such as acanthosis, uh, and I do a 75 gram OGTT in all my PCOS patients. So if that's normal and they have a high insulin level, like the, it's not going to change again the management. I would recommend generally healthy lifestyle, exercise, balanced diet. So, um, anyway, that's not what I'm here to talk about today. So, I'm going to be touching on thyroid management during preconception and pregnancy. I have no disclosures. Uh, I'm going to go through um, the effect of thyroid dysfunction in pregnancy and then how, how do we treat this. Just as a quick review of physiology, I'm sure this is familiar to all of you, the hypothalamus makes thyroid releasing hormone that stimulates the anterior pituitary thyrotrophs to make thyroid stimulating hormone that then stimulates the um, thyroid to make free T4 and free T3 that then go to um, the rest of the tissues in our body on the thyroid hormone sensitive cells and help them work. This is a negative feedback. So when your thyroid is making enough T4 and T3, you get a negative feedback, decreasing your TSH and um, TRH. In pregnancy, there's a lot of changes to the thyroid. Uh, there's an increase in iodine requirements. So typically the thyroid grows up to about 30% uh, in size during pregnancy. As we know, there's um, a large increase in your estrogen, estrogen in pregnancy, and this increases your binding globulin, specifically your thyroid um, binding globulin, but all of the proteins in our blood. When that happens, that binds onto the free T4 and free T3. And so that um, thyroid hormone is no longer biologically active. So the thyroid needs to output a lot more free T4 and free T3 to maintain the same level of free thyroid hormone in the body. So there's a lot of kind of stressor on the thyroid. And then in addition, the HCG pregnancy hormone, the alpha subunit, is very similar to um, the alpha subunit of TSH. So the thyroid can't really tell them apart. And the alpha subunit of HCG will bind onto the TSH receptors on the thyroid, further stimulating the thyroid to make more thyroid hormone. And um, this is why we sometimes see that low TSH in the first trimester. Um, thyroid hormone production, generally, if you, someone has a healthy thyroid with no underlying dysfunction, it will increase by almost 50% in production in the first trimester. Um, in response to, as we talked about, those increased binding globulins, HCG effect, you also get increased renal excretion and um, higher transplacental passage of T4. Um, and so therefore, a lot of people who have normal thyroid function before pregnancy declare themselves in pregnancy because they have limited reserve that we don't know about until there's that stressor put on the thyroid in pregnancy. Um, why is it important? We know that thyroid hormone is critical for the fetal uh, central nervous system development. It helps the neurons migrate, differentiate, myelinate, um, and with their signaling. The fetus doesn't make any thyroid hormone until the end of the first trimester and doesn't make a significant amount until about 18 to 20 weeks. So the first half of pregnancy, the baby really relies on maternal thyroid um, for that thyroid hormone. Um, so talking about hypothyroidism, how do we define it? Overt hypothyroidism is an elevated TSH above normal with a decreased free T4. Um, just a note for those here in BC, um, at Life Labs, the free T4 assay range is changing. So um, 
Right now we're getting a lot of false low free T4s, but the lower end of normal um, is gonna be changing to nine because uh, they've, they've reassessed their assay. So um, we're getting a lot of kind of false free T, low free T4s. Um, and then subclinical hypothyroidism is when the TSH is above the upper limit of normal, but the free T4 uh, is within the normal range. Now, what do we consider a normal TSH? Um, Outside of pregnancy, it's really whatever the normal range is on the lab. Although when we're talking about pregnancy planning, um, it's supposed to be a population um, specified range. Uh, you know, the guidelines say we can use four if we don't have that population specific range um, outside of pregnancy for women that are trying to get pregnant. Uh, just a quick touch on like hypothyroidism and infertility. Uh, we know that overt thyroid dysfunction, so high TSH, low T4, there is some data that it, it may increase the risk of infertility. And we know that generally the treatment with levothyroxine is safe, so it's reasonable to treat these patients. Subclinical hypothyroidism in patients trying to get pregnant, not undergoing um, any sort of artificial reproductive technology. Um, there's not great data that, that treating it um, changes outcomes. There's some smaller um, studies that, there, that I've mentioned here that it may help. And again, there's minimal risk. Um, so it is something that can be considered. One study looking at 94 women whose TSH was over 4.2 when they were treated with a uh, levothyroxine range of dose 72 out of the 94 conceived within one year. And there was another retrospective study reported that about 84% of women who were considered infertile who had a TSH over three, um, that they were able to conceive and uh, that time of infertility was shorter with levothyroxine. So in the subclinical hypothyroid patients um, who are trying to get pregnant, it's reasonable to consider treatment. Uh, the most recent guidelines we have for um, thyroid and pregnancy are the 2017 ETA recommendations. There hasn't been a lot of large studies since then that have come out that I think will significantly change the next round of guidelines, um, but hopefully we'll be getting some fresh guidelines soon um, just to go through the current recommendations. So in terms of should we test everyone's TSH if they're trying to get pregnant, there's no good evidence to do that. Um, there's no good data for universal screening. Uh, we do know though if they are undergoing uh, ART, or they're known to have positive antibodies, then we should be testing the TSH and um, the intervention can uh, affect outcomes. Um, so again, if they're, if they have infertility or potentially going to be going ART, we should be testing it and levothyroxine treatment is recommended for um, anyone with infertility with overt hypothyroidism. In terms of those who are going to be attempting natural conception, again, as I talked about the subclinical hypothyroidism, we don't have a lot of great data, especially if they're autoantibody negative. Um, I, the guidelines say we can consider it because generally levothyroxine is safe, safe for mom, safe for baby, uh, minimal risk. Uh, although I think in general, we probably are over-medicalizing um, a lot of women uh, in the sense that we do, when we put them on levothyroxine, we're committing them to obviously taking a pill every day and going for basically monthly blood work through the pregnancy. Um, if they're going to be undergoing IVF or ICSI, uh, they do recommend subclinical hypothyroidism. In this case, defining it as a TSH over 2.5 um, to be treated with levothyroxine and targeted TSH under 2.5. Um, the reason is the studies that look um, at subclinical hypothyroidism in the setting of fertility treatment have used 2.5 as the cutoff. Um, and then um, just for your patients that are undergoing any sort of ovarian hyperstimulation, it's recommended not to test the TSH during that time because of the huge like estrogen swings um, can really affect the TSH and it likely will settle out. So you wanna do it either before or at least one to two weeks after. Okay, so you've diagnosed someone with hypothyroidism uh, who is attempting to get pregnant. How are we going to treat them? So if they have overt hypothyroidism, TSH above the upper limit of normal, free T4, free T3 low, you want to start them on a full replacement dose of levothyroxine, which would be 1.6 micrograms per kilo. Um, the caveat to that would be if your patient has like coronary artery disease or is elderly, uh, most people trying to get pregnant would not meet that criteria, although there is probably a small subset that may have coronary artery disease. Um, in that case, you want to be a bit more cautious with your starting dose. Um, if they have subclinical hypothyroidism, there's two approaches. One would be to just start them at a low dose, 25 to 50 micrograms per day, reassess till you get that TSH to target. Um, but alternatively, you can start them at one microgram per kilo per day 
day. That's what I tend to do uh, because I find that I achieve the target TSH faster. Um, and people that are over 50 kilos, I'm starting them at a higher dose. Um, and I, I don't find that it, it, it over treats them like their TSH goes too low. In terms of counseling your patients on how to take Synthroid, it's very important that they um, take it on an empty stomach. So it's best absorbed 60 minutes before breakfast, but the guidelines recommend at least 30 minutes because 60 minutes may be difficult for a lot of people um, or four hours after the last meal. So for some people who eat an early dinner, don't eat anything after, they like to take it at bedtime. Most importantly, you want them to take it at the same time every day so that it's a consistent absorption um, and reaches a nice steady state. Uh, a lot of our patients are taking prenatal vitamins um, that get started on Synthroid. So you want to make sure you counsel them to take their prenatal vitamins four hours apart from their Synthroid as the iron and calcium can affect the absorption. So I typically recommend they take Synthroid first thing in the morning when they wake up and then take their prenatals with lunch or dinner. And I find a lot of women tolerate their prenatals better with a meal anyway. In terms of monitoring, you start them on the Synthroid. It takes six to eight weeks to reach steady state. So there's not a huge role to testing it much sooner. Sometimes I'll test it sooner if they are gonna be undergoing some form of ART in less than six weeks, just to make sure that it's trending in the right direction. Um, so, you know, you typically wanna repeat six to eight weeks but somewhere between four to eight weeks after starting. And then depending on your TSH that you get, you wanna adjust it in 12.5 to 25 microgram increments. So once they're pregnant, what are the risks of hypothyroidism in pregnancy? We know that severe maternal hypothyroidism is very dangerous um, and severe iodine deficiency, which luckily we don't have that uh, much here in Canada, um, but we can, we can see creatinism with that. So intellectual delay, deaf mutism, gait disturbances, spasticity. Um, overt hypothyroidism does have an increased risk of miscarriage, preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, abruption, preterm delivery, um, postpartum hemorrhage, uh, and increased perinatal mortality morbidity. So very, very important that we treat our overt hypothyroid women in pregnancy. Um, mild or maternal hypothyroidism, um, subclinical hypothyroidism, uh, the data is not great. Um, those that have positive TPO antibodies, there, there is um, a good number of meta-analyses and studies that show there is an increased risk of um, miscarriage or spontaneous abortion. Um, other studies have shown that the gray matter in the baby between eight to 14 weeks is affected by both extremes of TSH. So kind of like a, a reverse, uh, inverse U-shaped curve. Um, but then, and, and then there's some studies that show um, with subclinical hypothyroidism, possibly lower IQ scores, high risk of uh, autism spectrum disorder. There's other studies that don't show that. And that's just because the studies have not been very well designed. We don't have any big RCTs looking at this. And um, some of them use different cutoffs for the TSH, different, like, are they including antibody positive, not antibody positive? Just need some better data. Um, so again, like I said, for the subclinical hypothyroidism, um, some studies show low, lower mean intelligence scores, others have not shown that. Uh, there was a one um, larger meta-analysis of 18 cohort studies, so again, not great studies. There was an increased risk of pregnancy loss, um, placental abruption, neonatal death, but this has not been reproduced by other studies. Uh, antibody positive. So when I talk about antibody positive and hypothyroidism, specifically talking about mostly TPO antibodies or thyroid peroxidase antibodies, um, we know that the antibodies uh, cause destruction of the thyroid gland. So even those that have a totally normal TSH but have positive TPO antibodies, they do have a um, higher likelihood of not being able to keep up with the demand in pregnancy and a higher likelihood of developing subclinical or overt hypothyroidism some point in pregnancy. Um, so uh, the TPO antibody status is important to know. Um, and those with positive TPO antibodies, even normal TSH do an increased risk of uh, miscarriage. Although um, we tend to get more an thyroid antibodies as we get older. So it may be the increased maternal age could be a confounding factor in that and not the antibodies specifically. Um, in terms of treatment of hypothyroidism in our pregnant women, we definitely want to treat our overt hypothyroid women. We know that it's beneficial and does improve outcomes. Treatment of subclinical hypothyroidism, there was three RCTs that came out between 2017 and 2018, up to 600 people in the um, 
uh, cohort of um, that were randomized between levothyroxine or placebo. Um, all three of them did not show any um, benefit on cognitive outcomes up to age five. Um, and those big three did also, did also did not show an improvement in obstetrical outcomes. Now, the only issue is that the mean time that they started levothyroxine was around 16 to 18 weeks of pregnancy. So they um, started the levothyroxine between 8 to 20 weeks of pregnancy, but the mean was around 16 or 18, depending on which study you look at. And, and so we know that the fetus relies on that maternal thyroid um, hormone from the very beginning up until about 20 weeks and then starts making a lot of its own. Um, so what I would like to see is some really good RCTs where they randomize the levothyroxine, you know, preconception, uh, or I mean, I guess as soon as pregnant, but preconception would be, would be nice to see. Uh, some other studies that looked at TPO antibody subclinical hypothyroidism specifically did show a decrease in um, spontaneous abortion with treatment of levothyroxine. And just in terms of treatment of hypothyroidism, we only want to use levothyroxine in pregnancy. The fetal uh, blood-brain barrier is fairly impermeable to T3, so desiccated thyroid, cytomel are not good options in pregnancy. Uh, the fetal brain relies on maternal levothyroxine, or T4. Um, if you have a patient who's already on uh, levothyroxine therapy, because of that increased demand in pregnancy, they'll need to increase their dose. So generally, any woman I have of reproductive age, if there's any chance she's going to want a pregnancy, tell her as soon as you have a positive pregnancy test, I want you to double your levothyroxine dose two days a week. That would be about a 30% increase. Um, and then let me know and we can either calculate a new dose or a lot of um, women do well with nine tablets a week of their pre-pregnancy dose through pregnancy. Um, they may need a further increased dose because if you recall uh, someone who has a healthy thyroid, they get about a 50% increase in their thyroid hormone production in pregnancy. Um, but for a lot of women on levothyroxone, their, their own thyroid makes some thyroid hormone, so they don't always need that full 50% increase. Going through the current guideline recommendations, treatment of overt hypothyroidism is recommended in pregnancy. Um, pregnant women with a TSH concentration over 2.5 should be evaluated for their TPO antibody status. Um, so in terms of the treatment, this is it is it gets a little bit complicated in the guidelines. This cutoff of 2.5 came from European and US studies uh, in the 2011 ATA guidelines, it was recommended to use 2.5 as the upper cutoff for all pregnant women, regardless of TPO antibody studies. But we now know looking at broader um, populations that in some populations up to like 4.5 may be completely normal in pregnancy. So it's a strong recommendation that if they have, um, if they're TPO antibody negative and their TSH is over 10, so full like, um, you know, subclinical hypothyroidism, we treat them. Same if their TSH is greater than the pregnancy specific range, or you can use four if you don't have that. At Life Labs here, the pregnancy specific range in the first and second trimester upper limit is 3.5. Um, and they have TPO antibody uh, antibodies, then we should treat them. For those that are TPO antibody positive, but a TSH greater than 2.5, you may consider treatment. So I think it's a discussion with your patient. Um, again, about there's minimal risk, but we, this, this does mean, you know, monthly lab work, um, taking additional pill every day, and we don't have fantastic data that really is it going to change the outcome or not. Um, if they're TPO antibody negative and the TSH is greater than the pregnancy specific range, so again, they say four if you don't have that pregnancy available range, um, also can consider treatment, understanding that there's poor evidence. Um, again, you want to use levothyroxine, no other thyroid preparations. Uh, so your patients who are already on desiccated or cytomel should be counseled to change to levothyroxine when pregnancy planning or and definitely as soon as they get pregnant. Uh, what are we going to target once they're on levothyroxine? You want to target the TSH being the lower half of trimester specific range. If that's not available, then under 2.5. Um, those that are on treatment or are at risk of developing worsening thyroid condition in pregnancy should have monthly TSH until about mid gestation, at which point when the fetus thyroid starts to make some of its own thyroid hormone, there's not as much demand on the maternal. So recommended after that mid gestation, you can do just one more test around 30 weeks gestation. Uh, I tend to just give a, a standing rack for Q4 weeks through pregnancy, find it easier. Um, and if they are planning pregnancy already on levothyroxine, like I said, they should be uh, it, um, 
TSH should be tested, and then the levothyroxine adjusted to achieve that TSH value between the lower reference limit and 2.5 or the lower end of this, this uh, pregnancy-specific range that you have at your local lab. And this what I was saying before is that if they're on it and uh, they have a confirmed pregnancy, they should be counseled to independently increase their dose by 20 to 30 percent and notify their caregiver. One way to do this is to have two additional tablets weekly of their current dose. Uh, in terms of um, dose, what dose to start for subclinical hypothyroidism, um, typically like 50 micrograms a day is usually effective in pregnancy. Uh, there was a study that came out of Toronto looking at about 400 women. They compared them to getting 50 micrograms versus a weight-based dose. So if you recall, I said earlier, outside of pregnancy, we can use one microgram per kilo per day for a subclinical hypo thyroidism patients. So in this, they did 1.35 using that one mic per kilo as the outside of pregnancy plus about a 30% or 35% increase required during pregnancy. Um, in this study, the women that got that 1.35 microgram per kilo per day dose from the start achieved target range much quicker within four to eight weeks compared to those that started at 50 micrograms and then required dose adjustment. Uh, short talk on hyperthyroidism, um, same definition, overt hyperthyroidism, TSH is low, free T4 or free T3 high, again, above the pregnancy specific range if they're pregnant, um, subclinical TSH is low, free T4 and free T3 are normal. Uh, hyperthyroidism and infertility, we know that overt hyperthyroidism can result in uh, irregular menses. Um, it's been reported in 22% of hyperthyroid patients compared to 8% in age and weight match controls. Uh, free, high free T4, just like the low free T4, that inverse U curve has been shown to affect IQ, gray matter, cortex volume. Um, overt maternal hyperthyroidism can be quite dangerous in pregnancy, increased risk of miscarriage, premature labor, low birth weight, preeclampsia, maternal CHF, and thyroid storm if really severe. However, on the opposite end, subclinical hyperthyroidism is very well tolerated in pregnancy, usually does not affect the fetus at all. Uh, the placenta has deiodinase enzymes that can control the passage of the free, maternal free T4 um, to the fetus. So um, in fact, the maternal free T4 pool is about, sorry, I think the total free T4 pool is about 100 times more in mom than in baby. So the placenta will control that free T4 movement to make sure that baby isn't getting too affected um, by that subclinical hyperthyroidism. Uh, in terms of hyperthyroidism in pregnancy, the most common we see in that first trimester is the gestational transient thyrotoxicosis, which is from the HCG. So if there's higher ranges of HCG, like in twin pregnancies, if they have hyperemesis, we're more likely to see um, either subclinical or, or full hyperthyroidism in that early trimester and affects one to 3% of all pregnancies, probably higher amount, but we're not testing this in everybody. Um, there is no real adverse effects at all. It doesn't require any intervention. If, if they have like significant hyperthyroidism from this, you can treat symptomatically with beta blockade that's safe in pregnancy. Um, but usually don't need to do anything. We monitor it monthly until it resolves and it usually resolves around 20 weeks when the HCG decreases. Graves disease, the second most common cause, this is um, usually diagnosed with getting hyperthyroid and having positive TSH receptor antibodies. Uh, we want to target the free T4 to be in the upper end of normal to even a little bit above normal. Again, so making sure that fetus gets enough free T4. Typically, uh, in pregnancy, women come off of treatment because they we want that free T4 to be higher or at least have a decrease in treatment. If they do need treatment once they're pregnant, we're using antithyroid drugs, um, methimazole uh, or propothyroidal PTU. PT, they both cross the placenta, can cause birth defects. PTU is associated with less severe birth defects, face and neck cysts and urinary tract abnormalities. So we tend to use that one in the first 16 weeks of pregnancy. If they still require treatment, we'd switch them to methimazole as PTU has a higher risk of um, liver toxicity for mom. If your patient has hyperthyroidism in pregnancy, please refer them to any of the endocrinologists. Uh, this is something that we are happy to see at any time. Um, if mom is euthyroid but has Graves' disease with positive antibodies, the baby is at risk of hyperthyroidism and um, neonatal Graves. So uh, we monitor their TSH receptor antibodies in the first trimester. And if they are high, we repeat it again in the third trimester, anything above three times the upper limit of normal. The, the fetus needs to be monitored for signs of neonatal graves. So usually that's with uh, our OB colleagues and uh, maternal fetal medicine. 
Um, and then the antithyroid drugs, as I said, are more potent in the fetus. Uh, we wanna make sure that free T4 is up at the higher end of normal or just above pregnancy specific upper limit of normal to, to ensure baby is not seeing a hypothyroid stage. That's the end of my talk. Any questions? All right, Sawyer, that was awesome. That's a huge, huge topic to review. Um, and you did it in under 30 minutes. So that was amazing. Hopefully it wasn't too much. <laughs> no, that was great. So um, yeah, does anybody have questions for Dr. Huge Penner? Okay. Um, so this says, thank you so much. It was an excellent review. Um, in the SOGC committee opinion from 2020, the key messages indicated not to overtreat subclinical hyperthyroidism and not to supplement with um, levothyroxine for minor elevations in TSH with or without TPO. I find this challenging because um, this is the most recent opinion, but varies from recommendations discussed today with the 2017 ATA which SSGC does make numerous reference to. I'm curious your thoughts on this variance in recommendations on infertility specifically. Uh, yeah, it's, I think, really tough because we just don't have great studies. And um, I think it's this balance between, yeah, we don't want to over medicalize, but we also know that the treatment with low dose levothyroxine is generally safe. Um, well tolerated and doesn't possess like uh, provide much risk to mom or baby. Um, I think that um, you know the SOGC guidelines and the ATA guidelines, like the ATA is saying that we know it's poor quality evidence and that you don't need to treat people with a mild elevation in TSH, really only if, if it was truly elevated. Um, so I think I like to have a discussion with my patients like about the fact that we don't have a lot of evidence. Are you someone that would want to do absolutely everything, knowing that we don't have great evidence, but it's likely safe and, or know that most of the time there's good outcomes with the T, as long as the TSH is under um, four. Um, so I think it's, it's really that discussion in terms of infertility. Um, if they are there, I think there, I, there is good data that if they are undergoing ART, so I would have to re review the SOGC guidelines again, if they don't recommend it in those undergoing ART. Um, but I would I would recommend it um, based on all the data that I've reviewed. I do think it um, does have improved outcomes. And those have infertility undergo still under trying to undergo natural conception. Um, I, I think it's a discussion again that there isn't good data, but um, I think for most patients with infertility, I shouldn't say most, but they like often want to try everything kind of like the progesterone discussion vaginally. We don't have a lot of a lot of data. So I think it's really a discussion with patients about what we have. Perfect. Um, and then it is rare, but I have had patients who cannot tolerate Synthroid. In these cases, what would be your recommendations for next steps regarding these patients in pregnancy? Uh, so I guess that would be like, what do you mean they can't, like, why can't they tolerate well, it? I think she's probably thinking as well, like, um, we can't give them desiccated thyroid because it doesn't cross the placenta. So um if they are pregnant and they can't tolerate Synthroid, um, how do you manage that? Yeah, so I guess it would be like, what what can't they tolerate about it? So there is different brands there. So levothyroxine is typically we think of Synthroid, but there's l brand. So I have a couple of people who say they can't tolerate the Synthroid and I put l on it and they've had no problem. Also the levothyroxine or Synthroid 100 microgram dose, it has no dye in it, it's white. So some people, react to the dye in some of the other doses. So if there's a way to dose it, like if you think they need 50 micrograms, they can cut the 100 in half rather than taking the 50. That's, I don't remember what color it is. I always have to pull up the graph, but all the other Synthroid um, doses are colored. Um, and then uh, I guess you technically could get it compounded, but I, that would, I'd be very hesitant to do that. Um, I would try, but I would first try altroxin or the like dye-free 100 microgram mm -hmm. tab and see if you can dose it before um, switching to something else. Uh, definitely like desiccated technically would be a better option than cytomel because it has T4 in it, but it's much more T3 heavy. So typically to get enough T4 
for the baby, the mom becomes quite hyperthyroid from T3, while the baby might still be seeing hypothyroid state. So that's why desiccated is not a great option. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for being here, Dr. Hugh and for that really thorough and informative talk.